today's big interview, John Bickard from 91. My goodness, John, we have spoken many, many times over the, mm, I don't know, decades. Let's not uh, go into too much detail. No, but not a good idea. But I don't know when last we had such a confusing situation as we have on the markets right now. Just just for a, by way of background, going into June, it looked like value investors were going to be ruling the roost forever. Uh, we had a collapse of the growth stocks, then a massive rebound in July and mid-August. Then it turned around again. There's so many reasons why value investing, I suppose, right now should be almost long-term uh, doing a heck of a lot better than growth investing. But who knows? You are the ultimate value investor in South Africa. You've been at it. You've been doing it for years and years, and I've spoken to you in the good times and the bad. So uh, the the interview you you had earlier this year with uh, our ex-colleague, uh, Justin Rowe Roberts, um, was extremely well received by the business news community. So given what's going on at the moment, I thought here's an opportunity now to 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 pick up with a guru. <laughs> How are you seeing the world today? So, I mean, just as a, uh, the history of it, I mean, value, I mean, I've been running the value fund for 22 years and we had 10 years up and 12 years down. So it's important to realize where we were a year ago, that value investing had underperformed for 10 years consecutively without more than a three month rally over that period. And that was principally because of the printing of money, which reduced the discount rate, which made people buy growth or long duration stocks. So high PE stocks when interest rates are low. And that is why value in because that the last 10 years up to a year ago was a period of low inflation and low interest rates and everyone just buying NASDAQ stock. So you know, where we were in, in value was, you know, the first 10 years was brilliant and people like me thought, you know, we were geniuses, but we didn't realize that it was really just the cycle. And then the next 11 years, we realized, <laughs> you know, what comes around goes around. So what a year ago, the gap between value shares and growth shares was at an all-time high in terms of the gap in valuation. And you know, I think your listeners can feel that if they just looked at the valuation of NASDAQ and the valuation of uh, cement stocks or steel stocks or, you know, that gap was even higher than in 1999 at the dot-com bust. So we were at a massively extreme point a year ago and the market was saying we're in a permanent world of quantitative easing and low interest rates and you just keep on buying 30, 40 PE stocks and you keep on buying bonds, you know, treasuries at 1% or 2%, because those two are really joined. I think that's a very key point that your listeners should, you know, bond yields at 1% in the US supports PEs of 30 on, on NASDAQ, and the two go together. And that's why balanced investors globally in the last 10 years had the best time in history, because the bond market went up and the equity market went up. And in the last year, there's been a change. So to go back to what you were saying, there has been a shift. And, you know, it's been very choppy, as you correctly put, you know, three months here, three months there. But broadly speaking, value a year ago bottomed out. It rallied very strongly for nine months and it pulled back in the last few months. But, you know, nothing goes up in a straight line. And really what's changed is inflation. So... You know, the market a year ago was saying inflation is 2% forever in the US. And inflation, instead of being 2%, went to 9%. And the market is just a little bit worried about inflation. And that has caused the revival in value. But in the last three months, the market is now, interestingly, very interestingly, the market is saying in a year's time, inflation will be 2.5% in the US again. And then people have gone back into buy growth stocks on the back of that outlook. That's interesting. And that was something, in fact, that um, Kevin Lings, the economist at Stanlib, was, was talking us through a few months ago when it looked like it was impossible. Yeah. But a 2% inflation rate from, as you say, nearly 9% at the moment is, is quite a big ask. Is this yeah. the reason why we've seen that pullback? And do you see that just as a, as a bear market rally? Yes, 
I do. I'm absolutely sure it's a bear. And, and actually, if you look at the quantum of the rally that we've had since June, I think it was the middle of June, the mark of bottom, it's absolutely classic bear market rally. The duration and the recovery of the low, you know, basically the market went down 25 and up 12. And it's abs if you look at history of bear market rallies, this is technically exactly like that. But, but most importantly, the market is absolutely sure that inflation is going to be two and a half percent, and I I just don't think there's any way. So if you look, if you go back, you know, in the 1980, inflation was 20 percent in the U.S., and then Thatcher and Reagan killed inflation through the fights with the the unions, and then we went into this multi-decade lower and lower and lower inflation, and all the time bonds rise, uh, equities rise. And over this time, I think the, the problem was really started in 2000 when there was the dot-com bust. And then Greenspan cut rates to save the market. And then he created the housing bubble, which was even bigger than the dot-com. And then the Fed cut rates even more in 2009, and that wasn't enough. So then they started quantitative easing, which is really just rate cuts on steroids, which is the printing of money. And then they spent 10 years printing money creating the bubble in, any, in everything, which is bonds at 1%, the S&P on a 26P, um, Bitcoin, meme stocks, all these things. And that peaked a year ago. And then the world changed. And suddenly inflation shot up to 9%. Now, a big, a big uh, question here is, is inflation at 9% per, because of Russia, because of COVID uh, logistics? And a lot of the market thinks so. And I would just point out, those have definitely contributed. And in time, they will get less. But people mustn't forget that history has said in monetary policy, inflation is created from the printing of money. And in the history of finance, we have never seen so much money printed in the last 10 years. And yet inflation stayed at 1% or 2%. So the way I see it, it was like, Quantitative easing uh, poured all this uh, petrol on the barbecue. See, I say barbecue now, on the braai. And, uh, and if you like Russia and the coming out of COVID lit this, um, but the, the preparation had been done, which is 10 years of the printing of money. So if people think inflation is going to two and a half, they're ignoring how much money has been printed in the last 10 years. And then very importantly, um, this cheap money for 10 years, because really money's cost nothing for 10 years. And history says when money costs nothing, people misallocate capital. So there's been a misallocation of capital in the last 10 years. Too much because money was free. And then human nature is when money's free, they buy what is the flavor of the time. So people bought what was growing at the time, which has been tech and gaming stocks. And because they bought these shares to 40 PEs, capital flowed into these industries. And especially in the West, all that money has gone into let's call it asset light industries, which is Zoom and gaming and software, but no money went into building oil refineries or uh, pipelines or cement plants. And the West has completely, the infrastructure is completely behind as a result of this. So then you get a combination when a big supplier of these things, Russia falls out of the equation, and then you get a jam up in logistics because of coming out of COVID, and the West doesn't have all these all these fixed assets, you know, the, the oil refineries. And that is a step change from the last 20 years. And so, you know, to see inflation go back to two, you've got to say all those things reverse. And then the second thing is the low inflation of the last 30 years was driven a lot by globalization and the rise of China and cheap Chinese goods and low Chinese wages. And that has also changed. You know, Chinese wages are now no longer low and global trade went up for 30 years and it's been coming down for the last six years. And we're in a world of nationalization and a world of, uh, of, of nationalism, I should say, where a world where people are putting up trade barriers and, and a, a world where there are much more divisions between countries. And that is bad for inflation. So I think there's a structural shift. We had 30 years down for inflation. And we've had one year up and simply put, you can buy my story. You can't, you know, I think there's a change and inflation will be 5% in a year's time and not nine or not two. And let me tell you, if inflation is in 5% in a year's time, you do not want to be in US long bonds at 
and you do not want to be an S and P on a 26 PE because the market thinks inflation is going to be two and a half. And the sad truth is, you know, you look over a 40 year period, there is a very strict relationship between the valuation on the US market and the level of inflation. So if inflation is two, it does actually support a 25 PE. But if inflation is 10, the PE should be, it actually should be 10. And if inflation is five, history says the PE should be 13 or so. So, you know, the PE on the S&P is 21. If inflation settles at 5%, the US market can still fall 50%, 21 PE to 30, call it a 14 PE. That's a big decline. So investors who, who are getting into this market need to be 100% sure I'm getting in because I think inflation is going back to two and a half. Then, you know, I don't think you'll make any money because the PE is 21. You, you, you know, maybe it'll support the market. In the unexpected event that inflation sticks at five, you could easily lose a third to a half of your money from here. So the the people who are investing in in growth stocks, from your perspective, are discounting continuation of paradise. Uh, or the best possible scenario. <laughs> no, they're just crazy. That's all they yeah. No, I mean, you're, you're 100% right. That's exactly, they, they, they are saying the last 10 years will be the next 10 years. And, and I must say something else that is quite important is there's this concept of the Fed put where the equity market says, don't worry, the Fed will always come to your aid. And we're seeing a bit in, this, in the market, in this rally we've seen the last three months because the market actually expects rates to go higher in the short term and then the Fed to start cutting rates next year. And that is a version of the Fed put where we've seen in the last 15 years, every time the equity market came down, the Fed came and cut rates or started QE. And the equity market started to believe that the Fed cares about equities. I mean, I've had people who actually say to me, the Fed will never let the market go down. And they're 100% wrong because what they're confusing is in the last 10 years, every time the market came down, the Fed did actually print more money and cut rates, but it wasn't because they care about equity investors. It was because we lived in a world of deflation. And if you've got deflation and you've got falling markets and you've got a pile of debt like the world has, the falling markets reinforces the deflation. And the one thing the Fed wants less than inflation is deflation, because if you have deflation with all this debt, I mean, the game's up. So every time the equity market came down, but remember inflation was 1% or 2% in the US, the Fed then cut rates. But this time around, the markets, this time around the market fell 20%, but inflation's 9%. The Fed cannot cut rates at nine, obviously, and it can't cut rates at five. They can only cut rates at one. And there's another important point. If you think back 18 months ago, the Fed actually changed its policy. Remember they used, they had a, we look at inflation, they change their official policy is we look at inflation, average inflation over the medium term. They didn't actually explicitly say if it was two years or five years, the market thinks it's two to five years. So this is a very important thing that 18 months ago, when inflation was really low, the Fed changed its policy. But now it's going to backfire on them because inflation is nine and then, and then five. If they look at average inflation, they can't, even if inflation did go back to two and a half in six or nine months time, their official policy is they need to look at inflation over the last two years when it's been going at nine and 5%, how can they cut rates? So all I see is rates going up in the short term, which everyone else agrees. And then I see rates going up some more. And uh, you need to have your money in short duration stocks, in stocks that pay you big dividends now, because you need to take the money now because you get the money in hand and then you can reinvest it to take care, to protect you from inflation. If you invested in Twitter um, and not Twitter in Tesla, you know, then you really, your money is only arriving in 20 years time. Or maybe it'll be arriving, but let's say it is. You don't want that in a high inflation world because you need the money up front so you can redeploy it today to protect yourself from inflation. Before we, we go on to the stocks that you should be buying, it's yeah. often said that it's much easier to find the losers than the winners. I, I'm, I'm sure you've come across that book, um, Engines That Move Markets. And in there, after, I don't know how many he does, 15, as it were, of these innovative changes, he says, 
don't try and pick the winners because it's very difficult, but you can pick the losers. So pick some losers for us. What Tesla you've already suggested. Yes. So I, in that world that we've discussed, the biggest losers are high PE shares. So the NASDAQ is a massive loser. It's been, and it's very simple. You know, I can talk through talk you through the theory of why it's, which is discount rates and discounted cash flows. But to make it simpler is if the world has changed from the regime of the last 10 to 20 years to this high inflation, just logically, the winners of the last 10 or 15 years are going to be the losers in the new regime. So if you're worried about, if you think what the world I've described is going to happen, you just simply have to say what have been the winners in the last 10 or 15 years, and they will be the losers in the next. And those are the US stock market. So I, I think that's the, the most vulnerable part to high inflation because it's the highest PE market. And interestingly, the rest of the world is actually is quite cheap. You know, the, the PE on the world index is fairly high, but it's because the US is 60% of the index and the US is on 22 times earnings. So the US stock market is the loser and specifically the NASDAQ. So the FANG stocks, the NAS, NASDAQ, Bitcoin, because that's the ultimate long duration stock because there are no cash flows and all the, all the things that have gone up in the last five years. So those are the, and you know, I wouldn't touch any of those shares because you need inflation to be 2%. And even then, I don't know how you make money. I mean, can you hope that the PE on NASDAQ expands? I don't think so. So those I think would be the losers. What about a stock like Apple? Warren Buffett, who's the ultimate uh, American value investor, has got a his biggest shareholding is in Apple. That's continuing to expand, and presumably, what Tim Cook's doing there is going to give that company runway into the future. When you talk about Nasdaq, are you are you including all of them? Apple, of Amazon, them. Uh, yeah. Net yeah, yeah, and Apple. I mean, Apple is, you know, I, I don't. I think the P is early 20s maybe mid 20s and profitability is at an all-time high margins at all-time high it's it's actually got the biggest weighting of any stock in history in the s p 500 right now seven percent well that's enough reason to ignore it you know I, go back two three years ago remember the days when naspas was 20 percent of the jc there was enough reason not to have it so i would include apple in that and it's a, obviously a great company, but you know everyone in the world thinks it is. But it's on peak earnings, on twenty-four times earnings. How does it go up from here? It certainly doesn't go up in a world where where rates rise. It might do better than the rest of Nasdaq, but it's I don't see how you make money from here. Let's move on to the cheap parts, the the cheap parts of the world, and certainly if the rest of the world outside of America, and I see the rand today is again close to seventeen fifty against the U.S. dollar, twenty year lows. When you look at not twenty years low, all time lows, but the the, the point is that the the dollar index is at a twenty year high against everything else. So yeah. that too, by your thesis, would would make the American markets vulnerable. When you look at South Africa, though, many of your uh, counterparts are saying that this is really, really cheap territory now. And I would agree. I mean, I think, you know, in the value fund, we have 30% offshore, actually 35 now, we've taken 5% out at, when the RAND was 16. So 35 offshore and 65 in South Africa. And within South Africa, there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of uh, stocks that we really like. And we've got a lot of money in the mid cap shares. And we don't have the banks and the retailers, but I, I can't argue they're expensive. They are cheap. I just happen to think the mid caps are cheaper. So there's no doubt that South Africa has structural problems. I mean, there are, we don't have to go through all the problems that South Africa has, but everyone knows that. And even with the problems, you know, I can build a South African portfolio of good quality shares. You know, the negative is in a low growth South Africa, but I can buy, and I remember in the early 2000s in the value fund, we made a lot of money and we bought what we, what we marketed as the lucky seven stocks, which are, you know, when you're playing slot machines and the three sevens come up, seven PEs and 7% dividend yields. And in my experience, when you buy, it doesn't matter where it is, even in bad South Africa, 
you buy a 7 PE and a 7% dividend yield stock, you make money in time, providing this, you know, the balance sheet is reasonable and the company is reasonable. And I can find you 10 shares on 7 PEs and 7% dividend yields in South Africa, and that's where our money is. So it's shares like um, Roynet, which is a 9 P and a 7% dividend yield. Um, it's shares like ACI, 7 P, 8% dividend yield. Caxton, um, Lewis, Trueworths, these are all shares that we hold, which are just simply, are simply too cheap. I love that, lucky, the lucky sevens. Lucky You've seven. also got a big chunk of your portfolio in Tiger Brands. Yes. Can so Tiger Brands does mm. Yes. Well, Tiger Brands is just, I mean, you mustn't forget, Tiger Brands was 450 Rand five years ago. And everyone loved Tiger Brands. I said it's the greatest it's, you know, it's got 11 number one food brands in South Africa. It was growing at the time. It traded on 23 times earnings at 450 Rand. And, um, you know, at the time, the narrative was it's growing. It's got number one brands. And my argument was you've got to be crazy to be holding Tiger Brands. It was more expensive than Unilever. Then we all know what went wrong. It was Listeriosis and it was the cans and they lost the money in Nigeria. And the share went from 450 to 150. But at 150 rand, you know, Tiger Brands, the earnings has halved because of all these problems, but they still have 11 number one brands. And the simple truth of Tiger Brands is on an enterprise value on to revenue basis. In other words, for every rand of food revenue in South Africa you buy, Tiger Brands is the cheapest food company in the world. So it's, it's that simple. So... You know, there's not a, a major, a re, mid cap and larger food company in the world that is as cheap as Tiger Brands. It's got cash in the bank. It's got 11 number one brands. And interesting, even with all their problems, and we track it very closely, their market share in their number one positions is not falling. It's not like they're losing. They still have five categories where they have more than 50% market share. So here you have the cheapest food company ungeared in the world. In a major market, it is the biggest food company in Africa. So it's unbelievably cheap. And in my experience, this has been, this is the stock that if you had to write all the attributes for a private equity buyout, Tiger Brands ticks all the boxes. Because what is Ty, what do private equity want? They want 11 number one brands. They want a hundred year old company. They want an ungeared balance sheet so that they, when they take it out, they can put gearing in the company so they don't have to pay for all of it. Basically, the, pump, the company pays for some of the buyout. And it's got, let's just say it has a history of, in the last five years, 10 years, poor management. So if, you, if you're a private equity player, you come in, um, you lever up the company, you change the management. Or if you're a major international food company who's not in Africa, and we saw that um, uh, recently when PepsiCo came in and bought Pioneer, well, you know, the equivalent, the price they paid for Pioneer would equate to about 260 Rand for Tiger Brands and the shares 150. So there's, there's a lot of hidden value there. So it doesn't fit in the lucky sevens because the earnings are depressed. So the PE is still 13, but the earnings have halved. So what I'm saying of normalized earnings, if the earnings went back to where they were five years ago, the, the PE is actually six and a half for a food company. And I think the earnings will start to recover. And actually, the management are doing a better job. They're cutting costs. So this is, this is the best idea. That's why I have 10% in it. Mm -hmm. uh, John, one of the questions always about value investors is when do you decide, A, to sell, and B, that the company, or how do you know that the company that you're investing in is not one of those losers? Newspapers for a long time looked incredibly cheap, for instance. And a lot of value investors invested in newspaper companies until they realized that, hang on, they were in a cyclical or a structural uh, decline. Yeah. How, do you, how do you weigh those two issues up? Yeah, so I think a big thing is, look, if, if the company is in 100% in an area that is going to zero, then you can't buy it. So, for instance, years ago, we nearly bought Kodak because it was unbelievably cheap. But even value investors would say, look, it's 100% in physical printing of photographs, and that's going to zero, or, or it's going down 99%, so we didn't buy it. But that doesn't mean, you know, it's quite rare to find a company with 100% of its business is going structurally to zero. So for instance, one of our top 10 holdings is Caxton, which you would fit into that category, you're saying Caxton is 
in newspapers and it's going to zero. So the interesting thing is three years ago, I had a bet with some of my colleagues when I said Caxton is going to do better than Nuspas and everyone rolled on the floor because everyone knew Nuspas is in the new world and Caxton's in the old world. The only difference was that Caxton was four rand a share and was 11 rand 50 years ago. So, and was trading on a five PE and, uh, you know, basically was trading at the value of its cash in the business. So, and very importantly, not all of Caxton is newspapers, you know, for a start, the newspapers that are in Caxton are community newspapers, which are declining quicker than nationals. And very importantly, like half of their business is in packaging. So, it's easy to say we don't buy Caxton because of newspapers, but if you actually look closely at it, packaging is a GDP type of business. There's nothing wrong with it. And the newspapers were better than average newspapers. And most importantly, you weren't even paying for the business because the cash in the business was equal to the market cap. And then they did a few clever things. They bought impact very low. They sold some businesses people hadn't recognized with uh, in fiber. And the next minute, two, three years later, Caxton has doubled over the last two years. And NASPAS, NASPAS is down 50%. Now that's quite a big difference. One is doubled and one's down 50. So that is a massive gap and it shows you, you know, even though it would be common sense, you wouldn't buy Caxton. That is a massive outperformance. And today I still hold my Caxton. It gives me a 6% dividend yield. It basically is still really trading at the value of impact and the cash. You're still getting the business for free. Business is declining, but it still generates 400 million rand of free cash flow a year. And so that shows you the art of investing is not to just say Apple's a great company and Caxton's a bad company. It's to say what's in the price. Apple's a great company, but it's on 24 times. High earnings, not for me. Caxton is a declining business, but I'm getting it for nothing. And that is really, and that is something that, you know, I'd say to you, listen, you need to weigh up the two and say, what am I paying for? The market says Caxton will be gone in five years time. But the truth is Caxton probably won't be gone ever, but even if it is gone, it'll be gone in 15 or 20 years time. And that's the gap that you play really is expectations. And what are the probabilities of those expectations being matched? And the expectations of most investors are optimistic. I mean, you don't buy into a company thinking that it's, it's going to decline or that the share price is going yeah. to go down. You're buying it because you think it's going to go higher. But this, this whole thinking, uh, this whole story about ho hope not being a strategy, how, how endemic is that in investors' minds? No, I think it is quite a big part of the market because, you know, people, people prefer a story to the numbers because it's easier to hang on to a story. So, I think the one thing you can never do is you don't start with a story. So I don't start every day saying what is growing the quickest in the world, because the truth is everyone knows what they just look around and see uh, Lululemon is the quickest growing um, athleisure brand in America. But you know, the truth is I can walk down the street and anyone can tell me that. So that is not information that will make you money because everyone knows it. Rather, when you spend your time looking at the annual report and the numbers and you go and you look at Caxton, and you say, OK, this is a declining business. But then when you go through the numbers, you say, well, guess what? I'm not paying for it. And there's a big part of the business that. So the secret is to go into the numbers and not buy the theme. So I never start off by saying I want this kind of share. I, don't, I want a renewable share or a tech share. I start off by saying I want to buy things that have been falling for seven years and that everyone hates. And then I do the work and say, has it got a chance? No, it's Kodak, it doesn't have a chance. Or no, it's African Bank, which has too much debt. So you throw those ones out. It's like Caxton, where it's declining slower than people think, and you're not paying. And that's the secret. So you start bottom up. You, you, you buy the losers. You, uh, and then you go through the detail of the losers. And you make sure they'll be around and that you, you thematic investing is, it's crazy. And you make money in the short term, but you know, you make money, you lose it all, you know, like has happened in a lot of tech stocks. John Bicard, the value investors, value investors.